Good morning. That song's obviously a prayer that you're here and you're available and you are here and you are available. And anytime we make ourselves available to God, then this is what happens. He gives us himself. And when he gives, we're saying, I'm available. He goes, okay, I'm going to fill you with me. And what that means, he fills us with his peace, his joy, his strength, his wisdom, his power to, for breakthrough. I don't know what you need, but this is what God does. He fills the gap. There's a scripture that says, let the weak say, I am strong. He's saying you're weak, but I'm going to fill that gap from weakness to strength, and you're going to be strong now. And, 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 and it's important... It's important to know that you got limits and I got limits. Uh, you know, sometimes we try to be so strong and we're really faking ourselves out. And that's when we become sarcastic. We overdo stuff. Like, have you ever heard of this? Like, you're overdoing it. And, and we overdo it because we try to compensate for our weaknesses. We don't want nobody to see them. So we overdo stuff. But the real life, if you just realize, I am weak and I need God's strength. You're, gonna, you're in a great place to receive something if you just acknowledge, I need some help. Does anybody here need some help, maybe with your family, your relationships, your mind, your thinking? You don't, there, there's a scripture that says, be strong in the Lord. It's okay to get a good education. It's okay to, you know, make a good living, get great savings and all those things. It's good, but don't depend on it. There's certain things that money can't buy, and there's strength for situations that you don't have enough strength for, but God does. And that's when you can have confidence and finally say, because you're trusting in God and making yourself available to him, that's what prayer is about, that's what worship's about, that's what this moment's about. And when you do that, this is what we do. We leave room for God to work. This is what we're doing today. I'm proud of you, everyone that's online. Thank you for tuning in. Are you guys ready to get into the word today? Yeah, we're, we're in the book of James, and we're going to be in James chapter 1, verse 26 and 27 today. We're going through the book of James this month, verse by verse. If you come Wednesday, we'll pick up right where we left off. Every, every day, there's a portion of Scripture. If you, if you download our app, it'll say 30-day growth, and it'll show you every day you'll have a video that will explain the, and a video on the teaching on that day's Scripture. But also, it'll give you... Uh, the scriptures that we're going to be reading every single day. All I would do is re I recommend that you follow along with us. We're also doing a fast, and that just means that this is what we're fasting. We're fasting all other drinks but water. That means you could eat whatever you're going to eat, but this is what we're doing. We're just drinking water with our meals. It's a little hard, especially if you have a ca caffeine addiction or, or you have one of those, you know, Red Bull addictions, you know. Uh, or Coke or Pepsi addiction. But, but if you do this, this is what you're doing. You're, you're, doing your part to, of, you're doing your part to draw close to God. And there's a portion of scripture that says this, draw close to me and I'll draw close to you. And all it is is that you're saying, it's not being religious, it's just being intentional. Lord, I want to right now uh, just be focused on you. And also we're fasting, YouTube stuff, internet um, Instagram, Facebook stuff, and we're giving more time to God reading the Bible and maybe re, um, looking at some Christian content. But right now we're going to get into the Word of God and, and I pray that you hear it and you understand it and let it transform you. The purpose of being in a place like this is to hear the Word of God, hear it, understand it, and let it transform us. We should be better people by the end of this message because we grew a little bit. How many believe that's going to happen? Also, I want to invite you on uh, this Wednesday, I'll be speaking at the Proof LA. It's really for leaders at that moment, but we're really, I would just want our church to represent us at 10 o'clock in the morning. If you can make it there, please show up. Um, they're having me speak, but our church really needs to represent that morning and just come and support what God is doing in Pomona. What, I don't think it's a coincidence. We're doing our grand opening next month, and there's a revival coming to Pomona right now to set it up. So uh, we'd love to see you there if you can make it. 10 o'clock in Pomona. We'll be there for a couple hours worshiping God and seeing what God is saying for our times that we're living in. So let's pray. Father, 
We just thank you for this time to study your word. I'm so grateful for everyone that's here. Everyone matters. You care about everyone. And the way we connect with you is by faith. That means our belief. And you said in your word that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. That means the more we hear the word, the more our faith builds. So I thank you, Lord, that our faith in you will grow today. And you'll transform our lives by this study which from, which from James chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. Reveal your word to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So glad you're here. Awesome. So we're going to pick up with James. And, and to give you a background, the verse before, uh, verse 25, James is talking about don't just be a hearer of the word, but be a doer of the word. That means that you could hear the word, understand the word, but faith without action, I'd say I believe it, but unless you do it, the scripture saying, James is saying in the scripture, your faith is dead, it's powerless, unless it transforms your life and your behavior. How many believe that you should have integrity? That means what you believe and what you speak and how you live should be the same thing, right? You shouldn't be the parent that says, do as I say, but don't do as I do. There's kids that learn how to cuss, and you say, stop cussing. I'm going to put soap in your mouth. And while you're telling them, stop cussing, you're cussing. So you're telling them, don't do as I do, just do as I say. Um, that doesn't work anywhere, and it doesn't work with Christians either. What, what God wants us to do is be salt and light in this world. I mean, season this world with a lifestyle that's godly or like Jesus. Christians are not just saved, they're transformed. That Christians aren't just saved. The Spirit of God comes inside a believer. When you're a believer, it's not just believing in Jesus, that he exists, that you've actually had an encounter with Jesus where his Spirit has come inside of you, and that's called being born again. So you shouldn't just know about God, you should know God personally. Now, when God fills you with his spirit, he fills you with his spirit so you can live like Jesus. Say it with me. Live like Jesus. If Jesus is in you, your life should be transformed. Now, James is now talking to some religious people that claim to know God, and he's going to hit them right between the eyes, and he's basically going to give them a test or a mirror to look at to see if they really are spiritual. So this is what James starts off with. Let's look at the scripture in James chapter 1, verse 26. It says, if you claim to be religious, but don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. And this is the truth that James is trying to get across. We can claim to be truly religious or devoted and not be. What that means is that you could believe you're something and not really be that. You could actually fool yourself. I'd rather James correct me or I'd rather be corrected by scripture and realize I'm wrong today so I could fix it than end my life and realize that I was wrong the whole time and I just fooled myself. How sad would it be that you think you're right and you're not? That's called being deceived. Do you know there's going to be a lot of people when they finally die, and that's a reality, one day you'll die, and there's going to only be two groups after it's all said and done. I know we got a million groups nowadays, a million identities nowadays, but the truth is, in the end, there's only going to be two groups. It's going to be those that are saved and those who are unsaved. That's it. Those that have a relationship with God and those that don't have a relationship with God. Those that place their faith in Jesus as their Lord and Savior and those that didn't. And he's saying, okay, you claim to be religious. And that word religious means, it's not a bad word. It just means this. You claim to be devoted to God. Say it with me. Devoted to God. A true worshiper of God. Godly, born again, spiritually mature. You claim that, but let's now see if your claims are true or false. So now what he does, he gives us right now uh, three things that you can gauge your life by to see if you really are devoted to God. I rem we can deceive ourselves. I remember one day, and this is a weird example, but I remember one day when I was like 11 years old, 
uh, I was living in Montclair, California, and I used, I, I love baseball, and I wanted to be a professional baseball player at 11 years old, and what I saw was a lot of baseball players spitting. They used to, like, get tobacco and spit everywhere they went. So I just figured out that if I want to be a better baseball player, I need to start spitting. So everywhere I went, I was just like spit, just trying to be cool, spit here, spit there, spit everywhere. I mean, everywhere I was spitting. And my, my mom, she, she brought me into the kitchen and she goes, I've noticed you're picking up a bad habit. I go, what? She goes, everywhere you go, you're spitting. I go, I don't have a bad habit. I, I just do that once in a while. And right when I was talking to her, I spit right there in the kitchen floor. I was deceiving myself. I thought I wasn't addicted. I was addicted to spitting. And I couldn't believe I spit right there in the kitchen floor. At that moment, I realized I was addicted to spitting. I realized I was fooling myself. I've had a problem. Well, I broke that habit that moment when I realized I was addicted. I had a bad habit. Now, the purpose of Scripture is not to put you down, but it's to show you where you're really at, to find out if you really are as spiritual as you think you are. It's not to put you down. It's to make adjustments so you could break bad habits and finally get the results you've always wanted to get. How many want to get the full results? How many want to get the full joy, the full peace? And you also want to make a full impact. Say it with me. Make a full impact. So now he says three attributes of being tr truly devoted to God. Those who are truly devoted to God have control over their tongue. If you claim to be religious but don't have control over your tongue, you are fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. That means that if you're really spiritual, it should show up in, your, in the way you talk. Your words, you shouldn't just allow any words to come out of your mouth. That means as a believer, I don't know what your heart is. I don't really know what's in your heart till you speak. And what the scripture is saying here is that you should control your mouth or it's talking about you should bridle your mouth or you should, you should restrain your words or hold your mouth in check and deprive it of liberty. And all it means that as a believer, you should not be thoughtlessly speaking Every word that you're letting out of your mouth, you should be guarding, protecting, and making sure that it represents your lifestyle. What he's saying is if you're saying you're a believer and your words are careless, you have gossip in your mouth, you're critical, every other word's a cuss word, you're always complaining. You just say whatever. You, uh, let me give you a piece of my mind. I don't need a piece of your mind. And some of us, some of us, you justify your carelessness with your mouth. Your mouth is dangerous because it hurts people. And then you call the people you hurt babies. You know, they're just too sensitive. No, it could be that you're not sensitive enough. Because our words should not be hurting people. Our words should be encouraging people. Our words should be building people. Our words, come on, our words should be lifting people up, not putting people down. How many believe your words matter? So control your words. And just don't control the words you speak. Control the word with your mouth. Don't, don't just control the words you speak with your mouth. Control the words that you speak with your text. In your, in your blogs, right? In your DMs. Do your words represent your relationship with God? Because your words give you away. You could claim all you want. I'm a Christian. I'm on fire. I go to the way world outreach. I don't know how strong you are. I don't know how spiritual you are. I don't know how mature you are until you start speaking. If I hear you talking about people, if I hear you judging everybody you meet, if I hear every other word's a Christian cuss word. I say Christian cuss words because some Christians don't say the F word no more, but you say frig this and frig that and... 
and what you're doing is substituting cussing, it still means the same thing. Stop it. Damn this and damn, you got to get that stuff out of your mouth. What, pastor, you just said it. I'm saying it so you know you shouldn't be saying it. We're teaching right now. Well, it's just the way I talk. Well, stop talking that way because you got to start getting control over your mouth. You need to start budgeting your words. Some of you guys need to start saying less stuff because you're just saying whatever's on your mind and you're causing yourself and your family and everybody a whole bunch of trouble. All right. Are we learning? So control your tongue. That means control your words, your speech, your language, your communication. You should be in control of that. There are around 800,000 words in the English language. 300,000 of those words are more technical or scientific jargon, only, be, only used by specialists. That leaves us with 500,000 words from which we select to communicate with. The average person, though, only knows about 10,000 words and uses only about 5,000 words of those words in everyday speech. These words carry enormous power, the power to heal or wound, to encourage or discourage, to speak truth or deceive, to praise or criticize. How, what are your, what are the, what's the content of your words? Or are they hurting? Are they wounding? Or are they healing? Are they putting people down? Are they encouraging them? Are you cursing people? Are you blessing people? It's up to you. And God's saying here, control your mouth. And this is, this is what he's saying. I'm not going to do it for you. You do it. We're going to clean up our language. We're going to get some soap and just not just If you cannot control your tongue and you claim to be real spiritual, you're fooling yourself. If you cannot stop cussing, gossiping, complaining, speaking hurtful words, speaking negative and hateful words, this is the truth. Your heart is not right with God. I love this because if your heart's not right with God, you can get right with God. If you're a spitter, you could become set free from spitting today. I'm just kidding. We can be set free if we just admit, you know what, my mouth... I need to start budgeting my words. There's words that are coming to my mouth that are not, not under the control of the Spirit of God. They're angry. They're, 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 they're quarrelsome. I'm arguing with people all the time. My words are sharp. They're sarcastic. And I know that's not the way I'm supposed to be. And now I'm going to stop fooling myself and I'm going to start changing the way I speak. And God's going to help me. And God's going to help me control the words that come to my, my mouth so they represent God so I'm not fooling myself. Because if I'm fooling myself, this is what happens. The scripture says, when you're fooling yourself, your religion is worthless. You know what it means? It means you have your, your, your faith has no power to transform anybody else. That's all it means. Okay. Fooling means you're deceiving yourself, deceiving your mind, your thoughts, your character, your emotions. We can have self-control. How do we get self-control? Through the power of the Holy Spirit in us. Now, when you become a believer... The Spirit of God comes inside of you, and he gives you the power to do what you couldn't do. You can do it through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit produces the fruit of self-control. So that means once you become a be believer, you can no longer say, I can't help myself. You can't help yourself, but God can help you. Say, God can help me. How does he help me? With the Spirit of God living in me. Look what the scripture says in Galatians 5.22. But the Holy Spirit produces. The Holy Spirit produces. What does the Holy Spirit do? Who produces? Produces. This kind of fruit in our lives. Love. Joy. Peace. Patience. Kindness. Kindness. Goodness. Faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The Holy Spirit produces all those things with self-control. No longer you as a believer have an excuse that anybody made you do it, that you can't control it, that you made me mad, you made me upset, I did what I did because you did what you did to me. 
You no longer have that excuse because the Spirit of God now lives in you. And one of the fruits of the Spirit, or what the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. I can control my tongue. I can control my attitudes. I can control my responses. And I can control my life. Not because I'm powerful. It's because the one that's in me has empowered me to be like Jesus. I could be gentle like Jesus. I could be kind like Jesus. I could be loving like Jesus. Jesus. I can be happy like Jesus. Come on. I can be peaceful like Jesus. Why can I be peaceful like Jesus? Because his spirit produces it in me. It's not something I'm trying to produce. It's something he produces. It's just fruit of God living in me. And if God lives in me, it changes my language. It changes my ability. It changes my attitude. It changes my love. It changes my patience. I'm just a lot more patient. I don't know how I'm doing it. It's God's spirit in you. God's spirit produces produces it. And this is what you got to do is respond to the truth and the promise. Now respond means that you, okay, okay. okay so I could produce this. No, you can't produce it. He could produce it. But since he could produce it, you got to start walking it out. You got to activate it. Look what the scripture says. We must respond to this promise of self-control by declaring it over our lives and practicing it. That means I got it, now I need to start practicing it. I got it, so I need to start, what? Practicing it. It's kind of like this, someone um, deposits uh, uh, 500,000 in your account. And he says, I just dropped up 500K in your account. If you believe the 500K is in your account, I guarantee you, you're gonna go to that account and start withdrawing some money. Now, if you believe that the fruit of the Spirit is in you, if you believe that God is in you, you need to start going to that account and withdrawing everything that's available to you and start acting on it. Get your personal tuck card, put your pin in, J-E-S-U-S, -S, and get everything that God has for you. Because some of you right now, you're living in poverty because you don't know what God has done. You're still trying to do God's part. And God says, that's not your part. Your part is to believe the promises. I've given you my spirit. You can live like this, empowered by me. Me, so now practice self-control because it's in you. Someone say practice. I got it. So now I'm going to like start walking in what I got. I, how do you do that? Start declaring it over yourself. Look, in 2 Peter 1, 5 says, in view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. There's a promise. I've given you self-control. I've given you patience. I've given you the fruit of my spirit, love. Now, I need you to respond to it, though. If you believe you have it, respond to it. Supplement your faith with generous provision and moral excellence and moral excellence with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with patient, patient endurance and patient endurance with godliness. Um, and this is basically what you should be saying to yourself. The Holy Spirit in me produces the fruit of self-control in my life. Therefore, I exercise and activate the power of self-control over my mouth by not allowing ungodly and hurtful words to come out of my mouth. I will not allow it, and I'm not going to allow it because I have the power not to allow it. I'm going to get delivered from bad language. I'm going to get delivered from complaining. I'm going to get delivered from negative speech. I'm going to get delivered from slander. I'm gonna, I know they did it to you, but why are you wasting your time talking about what what they did to you, you're wasting your time. It's all that time that you're wasting. You're making your whole faith useless and worthless. Are we learning today? Another way to tap into self-control is through prayer. When was the last time you prayed for God to filter your mouth? God, <laughs> clean my mouth. Because understand, there's life and death in your tongue. If you keep producing death out of your mouth, you're going to continue. If you keep on speaking negative things, your, your mouth and your words are seeds that produce a harvest in your future. Stop expecting a great life when you have negative speech. Well, I'm just saying the way it is. God, you see, you don't say things the way they are. You say things the way you want them to be. 
If you keep claiming what you got, you'll keep getting what you got. My husband, he no good. My wife ain't no good. My kids, they're, they're baby kids. They're... You could continue doing a play-by-play -play on every wrong thing, Channel 7 News, out of your mouth, all the negative things that are happening in your life, and all you're going to do is keep on getting negative things because your words are seeds and they're producing a harvest for your future. If you want to start changing your life, you want to start changing your emotions, this is what you're going to have to do is start getting control of your harvest, getting control of your seed, and say no longer, and I'm going to allow filthy communication, gossip, and nonsense to come out of my mouth because I want to start getting a great future. You can't have have great relationship with people with a filthy cussing complaining cursing mouth MC Hammer said it back in the day for those that were in the 80s you got to pray just to make it today come on when was the last time you just pray praise God not just pray for your meal God bless you thank you for the food in the name of Jesus amen I'm talking about prayer that you're saying, God, I want, to eat, I want to be in your presence and I want you to fill me with your spirit and I want you to transform me and reveal to me the things that I need to repent of and change so I can begin to glorify you, so I can begin to show people who you are, so I can be more effective and start experiencing your full fruit in my life. You'll never have a fruitful life until you get a fruitful mouth. Okay, so now pray. Psalms 141.3 says, Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. <laughs> oh, I just want to say it. <laughs> this is a good one. Have you ever been tempted to just tell somebody off? Like they just deserve it. And you, Christians are pretty good at it. You'll even use a throw, few, throw, few scriptures and they're like, ah! Even if the, you use scripture, if you use it with the wrong spirit and you're not doing it in love, understand that scripture becomes useless in your hands. Well, I'm preaching the truth. I don't care if you're preaching the truth. If you're, not, if you're preaching the truth with the wrong attitude and you're not preaching the truth in love, every word that you spoke, even though it's right, has no power. Look at Set a guard, O oh Lord, over my mouth. Say it with me. Set a guard over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips to keep me from speaking thoughtlessly. That means you shouldn't just be saying what comes to your mind. There are certain things that come to your mind. You can say, oop, I'm not going to say that. That would be, I'm not going to text that. I'm not going to blog that. No one should be able to take one of, your, one of your blogs or one of your texts or one of your DMs and accuse you. Because everything that you, all your content is godly. They shouldn't be able to record a private meeting and use it against you. Because your private and your public life is the same thing because you have integrity. Now, he's saying... Your religion and claims of devotion are worthless if your tongue is out of control. When our tongue is out of control, all our gifts, talents, and claims have no power to transform others. The enemy conquers our ministry and renders us, renders us powerless when our words are not under the influence of the Holy Spirit. When you're, see, you say, well, God, the, the enemy's coming against me. Sometimes he conquered you already by a conversation you had a day ago that you began to speak under the influence of anger, hate, and bitterness, and you're still trying to do ministry, but your ministry has no power to influence others because your words, this, th your words, this is what they did, they um, disqualified you. Hmm. Amen. I was out with my dad um, uh, the other day at Stater Brothers here in San Bernardino. And when I went to Stater Brothers in San Bernardino, I was saying hi to everybody. The whole church goes to Stater Brothers in San Bernardino. <laughs> Praying with people, saying hi to people, talking to backsliders, bringing them back to church. All, that was happening. And then my dad says, he goes, man, because he never went out there with me. He goes, man, 
He goes, you got to be, you got to be always alert. I go, yeah, we got to live this for real. Because people are watching. And just one bad day out there that I'm upset with the reg the cash register. I don't got, I don't, you don't, see, sometimes you're taking an option that you don't have as a believer. You don't have an option to be rude with the teller. I don't care if she messed you up, took extra hundred bucks from your account. You got to do that still in the spirit. Because understand the greatest thing is not your hundred dollar bill. Your greatest thing is your testimony. Are you going to live a powerful life? Are you, or are you going to go ahead and trade in your name for a hundred bucks? Is that right? So if you can't control your tongue, he's saying all that devotion, all that church attendance and all that, all that jargon you speak is worthless, has no power. Worthless means powerless, devoid of force, devoid of truth, useless, of no purpose, empty, profitless, unsuccessful, without value, good for nothing. I've been talking to you like I'm blue in the face. I know you've been talking like you're blue in the face, but I can't ignore all the negative stuff that came out of your mouth. So you're talking until you're blue, but I can't hear what you're saying because your attitude is so loud. Praise the Lord. If you're here for the first time, all we're doing is just talking truth so we can start fixing our lives. We're trying to fix everybody else. And I learned this, until you start fixing yourself, nothing gets fixed. Is that right? We want to be a church that's under the influence of the Holy Spirit. That means our greeters, our ushers, our altar workers, our members of our church, that when the people come in contact with us here and they come in contact out there, they say, are you from the way? Because they see the kindness. They see the gentleness. They see the humility. They see, come on, they see words that are laced with love. Right? Now, I'll end this section with this. This section. I'll go to the next section in a minute. The words of the truly devoted are not abusive, but they're good, helpful, and encouraging. The words of the truly devoted are not abusive, but they're good, helpful, and encouraging. This is when we practice self-control. If the words we're about to speak are not good, helpful, or encouraging, we're not supposed to say them. Practice self -control. is What I'm ready to say, is it good? Is it helpful? Is it encouraging? If it's not good, helpful, and encouraging, you don't say them. You practice self-control. We don't let them come out of our mouths. Until we get control of our words that come out of our mouths, we'll never be given spiritual influence and, backing, and the backing of the Lord with his favor. He goes, I, what I do is I confirm the words that you say in my spirit, I'll give you my favor. I'll give you my power. But if you're saying words and they're not laced with my love and my spirit, they'll have no power. A person that doesn't have control over their mouths does not have favor with God or man. It, this idea, if everybody doesn't like you, don't blame them. Everybody's against me. Don't blame everybody. Could it be everybody sees something in you and your words are pushing people away? Your words are making people angry. Your words are threatening people. And what it's doing is isolating you to destroy you. They just don't understand me. No. They... Here you go. Blaming them again. It's your words. You cannot be, you, I understand, you cannot be a great leader. You cannot be a great minister. You cannot be a great influencer to bring people to Jesus if your words are out of control and you don't have control even over your emotions. You guys still with me? Look at this scripture in, in Ephesians 4.29. Don't use foul and abusive language. Don't use bad words. That's what foul and abusive mean. Worthless words, unfit for use. Harsh words, insulting words, words that cause injury, 
Don't use words that cause mistreatment, rude words, defaming words, slanderous words. That's what abusive means. That your words actually tear down people. You got to be super careful with your words. Even as a Christian, you got to be careful because let's just say this, that you know about spiritual warfare and you know a spirit that someone might be dealing with. You got to be super careful that you're, not, you're using that insight and attaching that demon to, the, to them. You know, they, they have a spirit on them. I could see it. It's a spirit of witchcraft. That good spirit, uh, Jezebel. If someone is dealing with the spirit of witchcraft, you're not going to help them by accusing them of having a spirit of witchcraft. You're going to lead them. This is how you're you're going to help them by letting them know that you love them. You're going to let them know that God loves them. And then what they're going to do is open up to you. And then you could set them free from their bondage. But they'll never be set free of the bondage if they don't even trust you. Stop talking about people you should be reaching. Are we okay still? Let everything you say. Let what? Be good and helpful. Let some of the things you say. Is that right? Let some of the things you say be good and helpful and encouraging. Is that right? No, it's not right. It's wrong. Look, let everything you say, not some of the things you say, let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Everything you say. Now, you know what that's going to mean? You're going to have to think before you talk. That means that before you say something, you're going to have to walk it through. Like, okay, how do I say this? And this is what you got to do before you send it, you're going to have to edit it. Erase. There's some stuff that you're sending you should never send because some of the stuff that you're sending and some of the stuff that you're saying and some of the stuff you're repeating are actually, they actually came from hell. They didn't come from God. And Satan wants to use your mouth to carry out his business. All right. Are we learning? Second attribute of those who are really devoted. Those who are truly devoted to God take care of the less fortunate. In James 1, 2, and it says pure and genuine religion in the sight of God, the Father, means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. But let's just talk about, he's saying pure and genuine religion in the sight of God, our Father. What God is saying, and through the scripture here, is that guy, I see it all. Say it with me. God sees it all. And the reason James uses orphans and widows, it doesn't mean that we should only care for orphans and widows. He was just using the most vulnerable um, segment of society of his time. And the orphans, uh, uh, the word orphan, uh, this, is, this is what it means. It means fatherless, one who has no parents to take care of them or teach them or guide them or comfort them, one without a guardian. Now, there's people, all, there's children all over the world that have no guardians. But, uh, but this is not like America. We have a foster care ch- uh, program. You know, when you go to Uganda or you go to Kenya, the kids that their parents have died or abandoned them, or gone, or or killed because of a war, these kids end up on the streets. Brian, the, the young man that leads our orphanage in Kenya, his mama was a widow. They had no father in the home. She had multiple kids, and she couldn't take care of them. So what she did, she put all their names in a hat, And she picked one name, and that one name of that kid was going to go to the orphanage. Brian's name was picked out of that hat, and she dropped him off at the orphanage. When we go to, when we went to, when we went to Uganda, there's a little boy, his mom died of AIDS. 
He's 12 years old. He's living on the streets. Doesn't know when his next meal is going to come. Fearful. Imagine being 12 years old, sleeping in the dark by yourself, fighting for a meal, scared to death. He came to church the day I was there, and I met him, and I said, how can we help you? And he just said this, Pastor, I'm hungry. So what we did, we took care of him, which is the right thing to do. How can we say that we're religious or devoted to God and ignore the distress of people, the affliction, the suffering, the lack of those around us and can walk by and say, take care of yourself, I'm good. And what James, who James is talking to is a group of hypocritical believers that were saying they're super religious, but they had no mercy and they had no heart for the hurting and the broken and the helpless. He goes, you, don't, you look at orphans, you walk by them, you spit on them, you think they're nothing. You look at widows, you do nothing about it. And, but, though, but yet, you're claiming to be spiritual. You don't give to it. You don't support it. You don't visit them. You don't talk to them. You act like they don't exist. And I'm going to tell you this. Some of your breakthroughs are going to come when you finally help someone that can't return the favor. Some of us are really, 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 really good. As you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. If I could get something out of this, it's an investment. We're all good. But when was the last time you gave because you just want to love God and you want to love people and I want to give and it doesn't matter, God. I just want to do what's right because I want to have your heart. And the more devoted you become to God, to God, the more your heart becomes like him. God's concerned about the least of them. God's concerned about the orphans. God's concerned about the widows. God's concerned about that little boy. God's concerned, come on, about the drug addict on the streets. God's concerned about the homeless. God's concerned about the prisoner. God's concerned about the sick. Come on. God's concerned about those that are being afflicted and they're hurting and they're being abused. And God's saying, if I'm concerned about it, how can you say that you're devoted to me and you're not concerned about it? How can you ignore it? See, one of the signs to prove that you're devoted to God that shows it is that you become generous to God's cause. So what we did with that young, that little boy, we relieved him of all his pressure. And we told him, we're going to get you food. I, I, we didn't just get him food. We brought him to dinner with us to the hotel and I brought him in. And he ordered whatever he wanted to order. And he ate with us. Then we took him to the orphanage. And you should have seen him the next day at church. They were worshiping God. He was there in the front dancing with all his might because his worries were gone because there was a church that feed, come on, takes care of the orphans, take care of the, take care of the, of the widows, has men's home, women home. Come on, we're going to inner cities and we're reaching people that everybody's forgetting about and we're saying, maybe everybody forgot about you. Your mama forgot about you. Your dad forgot about you. But maybe no one wants nothing to do with you, but there's a God that's reaching out to you and he's reaching out to you through us. And one of the ways that you prove that you're a Christian and that God's spirit is in you that you love people. I ain't giving to the church. Here we go. You're fooling yourself. You're not godly. You're not devoted. You're devoted to yourself. You'll give to you but, and you'll give to your cause, but you'll never give to a God cause. And you can't because you're not right with God. See, you can't give until this. Okay, you can't give until you're transformed. See, you become like God when God's in you. But when you only got you, you only look at your bank account. You don't look at the need. Are you still with me? Come on, did you want a better life? I mean, you can't take nothing with you, anyways. I mean, wouldn't you want to store up your treasures in heaven? And by the time you're done, wouldn't you like some widows and orphans and people that you help at your funeral and say, when I was hurting and I was broken and everybody forgot about me, they gave to me, they helped me get off the streets and I'm the person I am today because someone believed in me enough to invest in me. 
Amen? And all he's talking about, let's get rid of all this superficial Christianity that trying to, my gift is, okay, your gift is that. But if you don't have no love, it doesn't matter that you're a prophet or you're an apostle or you're an evangelist. We've got so many names and titles we put over ourselves. But last week we covered, how about just putting a title on your life that you're a servant of the Lord. He's your master. You're a slave. You do what he wants. Are you still with me? So let's look at the, I want to just cover this for just one more second. The truly devoted don't just give to relieve the distress, but they visit them. Now th this word care is a little deeper than just, I'm going to throw some spare change to them. But this word care means visit. I really believe that we need to become visitors now more than ever. And that means don't just say you love them. This is what we're going to have to do. You're going to have to show up to their house. You're going to have to show up to the prison. I know it's hard to get in and you have to go through all kinds of, uh, all kinds of trouble to get in and show your IDs and all that. But it doesn't matter. You do it because you care. You really show you care when you go out of your way. So we should be visiting the sick. We should be going visiting those that are associated with are in prison. We should be visiting the orphans. And the word visit is more than just I come by. It says visit means taking responsibility for their care. Now, we're not just going over there and we went to the orphanage. But we got people that are there right now on staff. In, in Uganda and in Kenya, they're taking care of them every single day, feeding them every day, helping them get to school every single day. We're clothing them every single day. You know what we're doing? It's not just a visit. It we're taking responsibility over them. When was the last time you, you, you said this? I'm not just going to be superficial with this. I'm going to go deep in this relationship and I'm going to take responsibility for the care of this person and help them develop help them be strengthened. I'm going to teach them. I'm going to instruct them. I'm going to disciple them. I'm going to introduce them to Jesus. This is what the problem is, is we want great returns with, with little to no investments. Superficial relationships, but we want deep results. Amen. Amen. Come on. Some of us need to go visit your mama. She needs your care. But she don't matter. You don't know my mama. She's rude. It's all right. Just go love her. She's sick. She's hurting. She's broken. Senior citizens in our, in our city, they need, they need some visits. Boys and girls, single moms, they need, they need, they need, some, they need, they need you to go over there, ladies, and go to their house and say, look, we're invested in your family. We love you. Teach them. Show them. Get a big brother for their kids. Big sister for their kids. It means to instruct them and, and then recommend them to Jesus. So it's a lot more than just, hey, I'm caring. But this is what you're saying, I care. Okay. And the last thing, I'll just give it to you because you, you guys want the whole thing. <laughs> Those who are truly devoted to God refuse to cor be corrupted by the world in sin. One of the ways that we remain devoted is just being devoted to ministry. Keep busy, bu busy visiting, serving, teaching, studying, loving, feeding, preaching. Refuse to let the world corrupt you. Now, that's a decision you're going to have to make. Stop, act, I guess, stop claiming to be totally devoted to God and your life is totally unholy. You can't, I guess, you cannot be devoted to God and be sexually immoral. Well, we want to, I want to redefine devotion. You can redefine it all day long, but God is saying, stop letting sin corrupt you. Stop letting lust corrupt you. Stop letting drugs corrupt you. Stop, come on, stop letting the, the lifestyles of the world corrupt you. And we're living in a time right now that is more relevant than anything. The church, the church overall has become corrupted. We're worldly like them. We cuss like them. We're sexually immoral like them. I said, God loves me. God loves you, but he never loves your sin. 
Jesus did not come for it to okay your sin. He came to set you free from your sin. He came to forgive you of your sin. And then he came to empower you, that power over your sin. There's no sin that you should justify in your life. I'm telling you, stop agreeing with the world's message. It's jacked up. I mean, and I'm telling you, stop agreeing just because it sounds right and they taught it to you in university. I mean... Who would have thought five years ago that we wouldn't know the difference between a man and a woman? What's a woman? I don't know. I don't know. What is that? Guess. Guess. What? And you know what, what it is? It's a demonic doctrine that's trying to redefine what God's already defined because here, this is what happens. I don't, this is what the, how the devil works. I don't need you to kind of, I just need you to agree on a few things. And if you agree on a few things, understand you're in agreement with me. And understand if you're in agreement, I'm going to go straight. If you're in agreement with abortion, you're, you're, in, agree, you're, in, you're, you're in agreement with this new, new million identities. You're in agreement with the trans agenda. I'm going to tell you this. You're not in agreement with God. And understand this. What, if you're in agreement with that, you're going to be offended by what I said. And the reason you're going to be offended, because you're devoted to something else. But understand, as long as you're devoted to that philosophy, which is the philosophy of man, that keeps sending people to hell, it's destroying them, it's making them depressed, they're suicidal, they're dying. I care about them. I'm not dogging anybody. What I'm saying, baby, I know you're struggling with this thing, but there's a Savior that can set you free and can give you eternal life. Come on, I'm a sinner just like you. I'm not no better than you, but I'm not going to go ahead and say your sin is okay because their sin is destroying them. There has to be somebody that's bold enough to say I'm a Christian and I'm not corrupted I still believe that God's word says what it says and I live by the word I speak the word I don't change the word to match my lifestyle I change my life to match the word give God some praise if you're a Christian that's not corrupted because if you're corrupted you're worthless You'll never lead somebody to Jesus. You'll never cast out a demon. You'll never be used to heal. You'll never be powerful. You'll never be an influencer because you've been corrupted by the world. You've been corrupted by the lust. You've been corrupted by the pride. You've been corrupted by the money. And if you're corrupted, you're useless. Well, and the James just said that. I didn't. I just repeated what James said with a little Puerto Rican enthusiasm. Now, the reason we talked about these things is because people really want to know the truth. You might be struggling with whatever, some of the things we mentioned today. You could be corrupted by pornography. You could be corrupted by by an addiction. And God is saying... I want to set you free and make you 100% pure. And there's a scripture in 1 John um, chapter 1, verse 9. It says, if you'll just confess your sins, admit you're a sinner. This is what God says. God says he's faithful. Faithful means he's, he'll always keep his word to forgive you and then cleanse you from all corruption, from all unrighteousness. So we can be made right and being made right is not a process. Being made right is a decision. Because when God forgives you, he forgives you. And I, I've heard people say, well, this is the way I was born. I can't change the way I was born, and this is my identity. Um, that's why Jesus, one of his first messages is you got to be born again. Because every single one of us are born sinners. How many know that? Um, but but the, the problem is, in our society today, we're not calling sin, sin. We're calling sin an identity. And if you just start realizing sin is sin and call it what it is, then you could be set free and have the life you've always been looking for. Because whatever you're substituting, you're thinking, man, if I just keep living like this, I'll finally be happy. The truth is, I know you're not happy and you can't be happy. You're going to go deeper into your anxiety, go deeper into your depression, go deeper into your confusion, go deeper into your anger. This is what's going to happen because the lifestyle can't produce the fruit of the Spirit. Only Jesus can do that. 
And if you put your faith in Jesus, he'll forgive you, he'll cleanse you. Then he'll put his spirit in you so you can live a life that you've always wanted to live. It's called abundant life. And then you'll have eternal life. Someone say eternal life. People are dying every single day. And some are dying with Jesus. I'm a summer dying without Jesus. I'll tell you this. God loves you. We love you. And it's your day. It's your day to say, okay, God, I need change. I want to be forgiven. For some of us, we need to dedicate our mouths to God today. God saved me. He wanted to save your mouth too. How many need to give your mouth to the Lord today? Just raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to come up. I, just, I need to give my mouth to God. <laughs> Very good. In heaven, there's a whole bunch of mouths up there right now. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I love you guys. And, and all of us, I think we need to do that because we need to not filter some of the things that we're saying. Some of the things that we're saying are just nonsense and they're hurtful. And, and there's things that you would say behind someone's back that you never say in front of them. And we need to cut that out too. Because that contaminates you too. But it's true. It doesn't matter. It's just, it's a waste of time. It contaminates your heart and makes you resentful towards them. They're not even in the room and you're just talking about them. And the people that are hearing you talk about that are building all kinds of resentments against them and they don't even know them. And when they see them, they look at them like, and they're like, why are you mad, dog? I don't even know you. I know you, though, because sister so-and-so told me you're. Right? So we got to cut all that. Amen. Come on. We got to cut all that. And let's make this atmosphere pure so God can move. Come on. We don't want our church worthless. We want our church full of the power of God. Christian, let's close us out. Come Christian, on. Come, come on. I'm gonna Wednesday, receive Wednesday, Wednesday be there. Yeah. I'm going to receive that word this morning. How many felt like you just took a, that was a convicting word for all of us. Like, I, I receive. Man, someone say, I received that word today. You know, we're in the book of James right now, and we're going to continue to get this message. Before anyone else leaves, I want you to go and remain seated this time. This right now is a chance and an opportunity for us to respond. We never leave a service without giving the opportunity for someone to respond and say yes to Jesus. And what are we saying yes to? We're saying yes to a God that loves you so much that was willing to give everything to forgive you of your sin. You know that we've all sinned. How many know that that's true? We've all made mistakes. And the price for our sin is death. It's death now, death in this life, destruction. It, sin always leads to destruction. But not just that. When we die, when we leave this body, we will go into eternity. And if we still live with the debt of sin on our backs, we will pay that debt by spending eternity separated from God forever in hell. Hell was not a place designed for you, but it's a place we choose to go when we reject God. But God is so good. He has good news for all of us. And it's that this, that whoever will believe in the Son, confess Him as Lord, repent of their sin, and turn to God. Today you can be forgiven and you can be saved today. Jesus died for you while you were still a sinner. He didn't wait for you to get right. As a matter of fact, there's no amount of good we can do to make up for the sin that we've committed. All we can do is accept a perfect Savior who gave his life for us. So if today you're ready to accept Jesus, you're ready to put your faith in him, and you want to be forgiven of your sin, and you want to say that if I were to die today, I want to know for sure, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that I would spend eternity in heaven with God forever. If that's you, when I count to three, I want you to raise your hands all over this room. One, two, three. Raise your hands all over this room. You're saying that to me. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see those three hands right here. I see your hand. Keep them high. I see your hands over here. Raise your hands high. I see all those hands to my left. I see those five, six hands over here. To my right, I see your hand. Anybody else? I see your, anybody else? I see those three hands in the back. I'm proud of you. Congratulations. I'm proud of you. Can we do this? Can we all stand to our feet in this moment? We're going to do one last thing before we leave. If you raise your hand, can you come up here to the side on this aisle over here? And you come meet us in the front. We want to pray with you. We want to congratulate you. And church, let's give them a round of applause as they make their way forward. Why don't you make your way out over to the side aisle. Come forward to the front. We want to pray with you and congratulate you. Come on, church. Let's get excited. This is where we get, we get excited. We praise God for all that he has done. God is good. For those that came forward right now, we're going to do one more thing. If you could do me a favor, 
We're going to help you take your next step. It's a class called Holy Warriors. They're starting at the way. That's your next step. And for all the altar workers up here, altar workers, look at me for a quick second. Make sure that you open the app and you click the I Got Saved banner and you're going to help them get connected to their next step. All right? But let's say this word of prayer. And who's excited? Come on, this is exciting today. Let's close our eyes. Let's pray. Say, God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross and to raise from the dead so that I can be saved. Forgive me for my sin. Give me a new beginning and a new start. Fill me with your spirit. Renew my mind and renew my heart. And this is a prayer for all of us. Say, God, cleanse my mouth from any unclean word from any covenant I've made, from critical words, from cursing words, cleanse my mind and my words and let my mouth glorify you in everything I say. Help me to honor you and to live for you and to care for others. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me and setting me free. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you, church. We love you. We'll see you here Wednesday. We're going to continue in the book of James. We're going to go into chapter 2. It's going to be awesome. We want to see you this Wednesday. Don't forget tonight. Redimidos is tonight. Concert. Get your tickets. Use the code word, the way, on boletosexpress.com. Get your ticket for the concert tonight. We love you. And if you're a young adult, we'll see you Friday night at 7 o'clock. God bless you. Love you. Have a wonderful Sunday. Remember, if God is for you, there is no one who can come against you. God bless you. Love you.